How's everybody doing today? Good. I, oh, yeah. Praise Jesus. Yeah, that was loud. Sounds like my daughter when she wakes up. Man. No, it's good. Lots of joy in the house. Uh, it is good to be with you guys. Ironman is, and especially the morning, is probably my favorite place, place to preach. Um, I love you men in this room, and so many of you have poured into my life over the years, and I just see you doing the things we talk about each and every week. Um, if I run out during the middle of the sermon, it's because Becca's gone into labor, and i got to get to the hospital. So, uh, yeah, we have our third daughter on the way, so you can be praying for that. Um, it's an exciting time at the Herrera house. There's a lot, of, a lot of stuff going on, so it's good. But if you guys can be praying for that, that'd be good that little Hattie Pearl would, would be here safely soon. Possibly this weekend. Well, I don't know about you guys. Have you guys been enjoying the study of 1 Samuel? Yeah. yeah, it is It is one of my favorite books in the Bible. And I'm not just saying that. I got to teach it before, so it really is dear to my heart. Um, we're really starting to get into the really good parts of it as well. If you guys remember uh, last week, Michael preached uh, chapter 12. So we're going to be in 13 and 14 today. I've entitled... Uh, I've entitled the sermon, Spiritual Fitness Test for Duty, Exam Part 1 is Chapter 13, and then we have Spiritual Fitness for Duty, Exam Part 2 in, in Chapter 14. I had to basically do two sermons because he took 25 verses. He gave me 75, so um, <laughs> we're going to kind of work our way best we can through there. Some of the stuff we won't get to, some of the stuff we will, um, and we'll kind of park at the places that are real important, I think, and, and really what the heart of the, these passages are. Um, but if you remember last week... Uh, Michael ended the verse on verse 24, which said, Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king. And those words would have been sobering because that is exactly what begins to happen in chapter 13. Okay, we're going to see that uh, Saul is going to fail his spiritual fitness for duty test. Okay. Turn with me real quick to, and I, and I, and I want to illustrate that, that I think that Saul had everything he needed to pass it, but he chose not to. So turn, turn with me real quick to Deuteronomy 17. You guys remember this has been spoken about, um, in our study of first Samuel, because we're talking a lot about Kings, you know, the King would, uh, was supposed to be the spiritual leader of the nation as, as, the, as we transition out of the, the prophet uh, Samuel to a transition of leadership with a, with, with a monarchy. But in, uh, in verses 14 through 20, Moses really laid out what the duties are and the laws concerning the kings. Okay, we're not going to read all of them, but uh, the first part from 14 to 17, you can sum up this way. You're not supposed to, um, it's girls, gals, and giddy up, okay? You're not supposed to have lots of wives, you're not supposed to have lots of gold, and you're not supposed to have lots of horses, okay? So those were laws that were just basic. Um, I had a professor that, that had us remember it that way, so it was easy. But there was something else that the king was supposed to do. And I think God, in his grace and mercy, has given us his word so that we know what he expects out of us. And as he has given us his word, and us now New Testament believers as well, and even Saul at the time, he's given us his spirit to be able to do that. So in, in, in verses 18 uh, in chapter, excuse me, in, in Deuteronomy 17, starting in verse 18, it says, And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, speaking of the kings of Israel, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law, approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it, excuse me, he shall read in it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord, his God, by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart may not be lifted up above his brothers, that he may not turn aside from the commandment, either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom and his children in Israel. And so what God really did for the kings of Israel is that he guarded their heart. One, to love him and also to take care of the, the people. And what I would tell you is, is that Saul did not do that. We're going to see that, that he's going to fail the spiritual fitness for duty exam. But, but bottom line, what is God teaching us through this? 
I think the bottom line is this, what God really wants us to know about this, and especially specific to us in this room as spiritual leaders in many different capacities, is that the bottom line is this, that the spiritual leader must have a heart to do the will of God. So the spiritual leader must love God and have a heart to do his will. Okay. And then the follow-up to that is how do you do that? Is that the way that that manifests itself in the leader's life is that he knows God and, excuse me, knows God's word and obeys it. That is what it means to be a spiritual leader, that you love the Lord, you love his word, you love his commandments, and you do his will. That is what God has called every single man in this room to. I think he's called all Christians to it, but specifically spiritual leaders. So let me pray and we'll get started. Father, we love you. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your commands, Jesus. We thank you that you are gentle and lowly and that your burden is light. Lord, you did all the heavy lifting. God, it was you that paid for our sin. It was your precious blood that redeemed us, that we can have eternal life. And so, Lord, as, as we are men in this room that lead in many different capacities as spiritual leaders, Lord, help us to do your will. And, Lord, we know that there are going to be circumstances in our lives and, and things that we have to do that are going to be hard. And it's going to take discipline. And it's going to take perseverance. Lord, but we know that you've equipped us through your spirit. And we know that we have your word that tells us how to do your will. So, Lord, as, as, as we look at Saul's failures, both in sins of commission and omission, Lord, we pray that we would not make those same mistakes. That when the moment comes where we have to make a decision to do your will or do our own, that we would always choose yours. Lord, show us that grace. Lord, I thank you for these men. I thank you for the example that they are. I ask, Lord Jesus, that you would bless our time in your word. I pray these things in your precious name. Amen. All right. So I don't know about you, but, but 1 Samuel, like I said, is, is one of my favorite books. I love this Old Testament narrative. This is such a beautiful story. And as you're watching and, 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 and we're reading today, I'm just going to make some observations that some of them that I saw, some of them that I uh, read from commentaries and stuff. But, but this story is so beautiful and it has so many applications to everyday life. Um, and so the, the way that uh, we're going to look at this first spiritual for duty exam, um, there's going to be these, uh, I've, I've broken it up into an outline. The first part is going to be the call in the country. Okay. And, and we want to have verse 24 in mind as we're starting to read this. Okay. It says this, oh, the, the other thing I was going to try to do so that it, it's not so, so much reading is I, I, I kind of broke it up in, in the way that ESV did in the little paragraphs. And we're just going to take a little chunk at a time. And keep biting. It's, it's, it's kind of like, if you guys ever heard the expression, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? We're, that's going to be our, our, our motto for today, okay? So here we go. It says, Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he had reigned for two years over Israel, Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and the hill country of Bethel. And 1,000 were with Jonathan and Gibeah of, of Benjamin. The rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Ge Geba, and the Philistines heard of it, and Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard it, and that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines, and also that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines, and the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. Okay, so the first thing we see, this it, it was really funny too, because uh, this first verse is, is it's I wouldn't say it's controversial, but there's a lot of different ideas of, of how we date this for for Saul's reign and all of those kind of things. I put on there uh, on the note Second Kings eighteen one. I think this is just a normal way that the that the authors uh, of First Samuel and then First and Second Kings just the way that they talk about the king's reign, okay? So Hezekiah is, uh, is there. I put it uh, 2 Kings 18.1. In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. And so this is just an introduction to, to Saul's reign. But it's, it's, it's a little tricky in the sense that um, for the one year, I think it's best to think of this, that it's been one year since chapter 10. You guys remember when he was anointed, Samuel kind of, kind of finds them and just chucks the oil on them. You guys remember that? So it's been a year since then. And then when it says that he reigned for two years, I think it's best to understand this from uh, chapter 11, uh, 1115. Let me just read that to you. 
1115. Uh, so Saul and all the people went to Gilgal there and, and they made uh, Saul king before the Lord in Gilgal. Okay, so this is like more of an official. So that would be, and then, and then the two years is going to go all the way up into next week when, when Pastor Michael teaches on 1528, when God actually takes the, the, the kingship from him. Okay, now even though Saul gets, uh, is rejected as the king, he still actually is king for a while until David is anointed king. So, because we have this this verse in Acts thirteen twenty one, uh, when Paul actually says, "Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of tribe of Benjamin, for forty years." So, when you start to try to reconcile all of that, what I learned about that is, is that I have a question that I want to ask when I get to heaven: is how do we do that? Okay, it it's it all lines up, and it's not that big of a deal. If you want to study more, go ahead and do that on your own. Good, everybody, good with that. Okay, here we go. So the bigger, more important part of this, um, you can see John Woodhouse kind of summarizes, summarizes it there, is that, is that Saul puts out, blew the trumpet throughout all the land. He's, he's calling people to battle, okay? Uh, John Woodhouse said it this way, this was presumably a call to arms. With the trumpet blast, there was a message to be heard. To refer to the people as the Hebrews was a strange way for Saul to speak. It is often Israel's enemies and oppressors who called the Israelites the Hebrews. It is as though Saul was addressing them as the Philistines saw them and as they have been, see, uh, have been seeing themselves as they certainly could soon become people under enemy oppression. Did you guys ever have a football coach or a basketball coach that put you down all the time? Yeah, right? We did not have John Wooden for our, for our basketball coach that was positive, right? I think Saul, even in this, is failing in leadership because he's not encouraging. He's actually calling them what it looks like to be when you're oppressed, okay? And I think as spiritual leaders, we have to be the ones that are encouraging. There's so many things in life that discourage us. We have to be the ones that encourage as we lead others, okay? We want to aspire people to, to greatness for the kingdom, Okay. But all of that is all to set up that there is that that Jonathan has gone out and he defeated one of the Gerasenes of the Philistines, and now they are going to be in an all-out war with the Philistines. Okay, and we see that in this next part uh, when we see the camps and the cowards. Okay, verse five it says, "And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel thirty thousand chariots and six thousand horsemen and troops like the sand on the seashore in the multitude. They came up and encamped in Michmash." To the east of Beth Avon, when the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead, uh, excuse me, Gilead. Uh, Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the people followed him trembling. Okay? And so you see two different, you, you, you see a contrast. You see the Philistine army gathering steam, right? And, and, and when we see those numbers, 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, this is a steamroller that's coming for Israel, okay? I think the author is actually setting up this scene that we're gonna see a little bit later in verse 14 of, of, of an impossible situation. And what do we know about impossible situations in the Bible? That, that God, that's most of the time when, we, when we're in hopeless places in the Bible, it's, it's exactly when we see the Lord intervene. Okay, and we're going to see the way that Saul reacts to a hopeless situation, and we're going to see the way that Jonathan reacts to a hopeless situation. Okay, but but, but another quality of leadership is Saul. Do you guys remember what Saul was doing when 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 he uh, when when he was supposed to be anointed king? You guys remember where he was? He was hiding in the baggage. Right. The author of First Samuel continues to contrast Saul as one who hides from from danger, who hides, who shrinks back from leadership. Okay, and I think what you're already seeing is that the people are following in his footsteps. And so it is very important the way that we are an example for others in life. Okay, so this is going to be the bulk um, of, of, of what we need to talk about tonight, or excuse me, today. This is today. Um, this is going to be the bulk of what we're going to talk about today. Uh, you can read that. Uh, you, you, you can read those, those couple other quotes uh, I just showed a, a verse in Judges so you can see that this is the first time this has happened with Israel where they're hiding. Um, and we all know what a cistern is, right? Exactly. They were hiding in them. So this is, this, this, this is bad for Israel right now. Um, but the next part is the compromise command. And this is really 
begins the downfall of Saul. Okay, this is the moment. This is the situation. This is what gets him to not have a kingdom anymore. Okay, and he's not rejected at this point, but it is foretold that the kingdom will be taken away. So let me read there verses 8 through 15a. He says he waited, Saul, he, he waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Samuel went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw the people were scattering from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said, Saul, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be the prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal. The rest of the people went after Saul to meet the army, and they went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. Okay, this is a sad day in Israel. Notice right there um, on your notes, 1 Samuel 10.8, The command given by a prophet of God, which is the equivalent to the word of God, right? We we know from 1 Peter that that, uh, the Holy Spirit worked through the prophets to speak the word of God. So this is a command from God. And and really, you got to understand that this is the word of God being spoken to Saul when, when Samuel says, Then go before me to Gilgal, and behold, I am coming down to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come and show you what you shall do. Now, I will say on Saul's part, he, he partially obeyed, okay? He went to Gilgal and he waited. But where he broke the command is that he did not continue to wait till Samuel came, okay? Now, it is not, it is not that he sinned in the sense that he offered burnt offerings. We'll see later that David and, and Solomon will offer burnt offerings. What, what the sin was is that he disobeyed the word of God by, by offering them and not waiting for Samuel. That is the sin. So it's a sin of commission. He, 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 uh, he was forceful in this sin. It even says that he forced his hand. Uh, Robert, Robert Bergen said it this way. He said, it is, it is ironic and symptomatic of Saul's spiritual dullness that the king believed he could obtain the Lord's favor through an act of disobedience. No line of reasoning, however compelling, could ever justify disobedi- uh, disobedience to the Lord. Okay? And, and I think all of us in this room, being sinful men, would have some sympathy towards Saul. Am I right? Yes. Okay. Well, as, as, as we might, for the king of Israel, the spiritual leader at that time, he disobeyed the word of God. And I think God's calling us to a higher standard in the way that we view his word. His commandments are to be obeyed. And yes, God is gracious and God is kind, but sin does have consequences. And Saul is gonna have to live out the consequences of his sin. Um, the other thing that I would say is that, that not only does Samuel um, point out to Saul his sin, but he also calls him a fool that it was actually immoral what he did, disobeying the Lord like this. Psalm 14, 1a says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Saul was operating like God wasn't around. He was, he was operating on his own. Um, he was operating on his own will, his own accord. J.C. Ryle has said it this way, obedience is the only reality. It is faith visible, faith acting, faith manifest. It is the test of real discipleship among the Lord's people. We as Christians, we as Christian men who are leaders, our disposition is obedience. But the other thing that I want to talk about as we, as we talk about this is this idea of doing the will of God, okay? 
you're going to see all throughout this this uh, series that uh, that these different people in the story, uh, like even today, Jonathan, we're going to talk about Jonathan and, and his faithfulness. Well, as faithful as Jonathan was, and, and as much as he wanted to do the will of God, he's still going to fail, okay? And what I would say is, is, is uh, you guys, most of you have studied 1 Samuel, so this isn't too much of a spoiler alert. But when it says, but now your kingdom shall not continue, the Lord has sought out an, a, a man after his own heart. The Lord has uh, commanded the prince over his people. So that other man is David. And Michael's going to get to that, and he's going to talk about that. And I think that David is a man after God's own heart in two ways. One, that he, that he really does desire to do the, the, the will of God. So he's a man of, of the Torah, right? He's a man of God's word. But the other thing is that God's the one that chose him. Saul is the people's choice. David is God's choice. But I will tell you with, uh, with the, <laughs> what I would tell you though, is as you read 1 Samuel and you even get into 2 Samuel, David, David's a sinner as well. So we're not, so what 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel and David's life and Jonathan's life and Saul's life is all pointing us to is that we're looking for one that does the will of God completely and perfectly. So 1 and 2 Samuel point us to Christ, okay? And so I want you to hear the, the, the words of Christ as we think through this and what our standard is and what we, what we are going to strive to. Because we're not going to strive to be like Jonathan. We're not even going to strive to be like David. We want to strive to be like Christ. So John, uh, John 4, 34 says this. Um, you, you guys remember uh, Jesus has just been at the, the, um, with the woman at the well. His disciples are like, hey, you got to eat, right? He's one of those guys who's just going. But Jesus said to them, he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. And what he means by that is my sustenance in life. What I'm here to do is to do the will of God. And that should be true of us as well. John, 30, uh, John 6, 38 says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Oh, sorry, I didn't know where you guys are on the page. Um, as well as um, probably the greatest act of obedience in the face of, of a hard circumstance, because Saul was in a hard circumstance. I don't want to downplay what, what was going on. We've all been in those circumstances where we just can't wait for God, but we need to, right? But Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke 22, 41 through 42 says, And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That is what it looks like for the king's heart to obey and do the will of God. That is what we are to strive to. There was this anonymous quote that was, that was really good because Saul is going to not, um, though, though the kingship is not taken from him immediately, it's, pro, it's, it's prophetically said that his kingdom will not go on, okay? So Jonathan will not be the next king at, at, at this point in the story. Uh, this, this anonymous quote, though, it says, the cost of obedience is nothing compared to the cost of disobedience. Let that one ring around in your head for a little bit today, Okay. Uh, Dale Ralph Davies has said this. He said, but the worst of Saul's liabilities was that he was without guidance of Yahweh from his prophet. To be stripped of the direction of God's word is to, truly, uh, to be truly impoverished and open to destruction. It is, the one thing, uh, it is one thing to be in terrible distress. It is another to be alone in that distress. Saul isolated himself from what he needed most, the word of Yahweh for his way. And we see that as it says that um, Samuel arose and went from Gilgal. So you, you can think of that as that he no longer has the word of God with him in a sense, right? And so what I would encourage you and, and many of you in this room, just to the fact that you're here today, is that to be around the word of God as much as you can, to be involved with each other, to hold each other accountable to this high standard that God has given us as we pray and ask for his grace and strength for this. All of us will be in a hard circumstance at some point. And we will need to choose his will rather than ours. Proverbs 8, uh, isolating yourself is, is, is just not a good thing to do. Proverbs 18.1 says, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. And so there is a built-in grace in the church that we could be with one another, that we could be in the word together. Um, all of you in this room 
are doing that as we speak. But even, um, even on a deeper sense in this sin that, that happened with Saul, is that Saul is really portrayed as an Adam figure. Does that make sense? He was a representative of the people, and he failed, okay? It's even interesting that, that Samuel, in his, uh, when he calls him out in, he, uh, in verse 11, it says, Samuel said to him, what have you done? You guys remember those words from Gen- Genesis 3? What have you done? It's one of those moments. Alfred Edersheim has said this. It says, as Adam's d- obedience was tested in, c- in a seemingly small matter and his failure involved that of his race, so also in the, in the case of Saul, his partial obedience was and his anxiety to offer the sacrifices as in his mind in themselves efficacious, excuse me, uh, only rendered it more necessary to bring to the foreground the great question of absolute unquestioning and believing submission to the will of the heavenly king, Saul's kingdom had shown itself not to be God's kingdom, and its continuance, therefore, and henceforth impossible. Saul failed the fitness of duty, the the spiritual fitness of duty tests. And men, we will be faced with situations, um, some of our own doing, some of ourselves putting us in situations, some of circumstances that will happen, But I will tell you that we need to make sure that we have the word of God hidden in our hearts, that that it is our truest desire to do his will, so that in the moment, we will choose to obey rather than disobey. The next thing we see, though, is the contemptible companies. It says, uh, and Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about 600 men, and Saul and Jonathan his son and the people who were present with them stayed in Geba of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash and the raiders came out of the camp and the Philistines in three companies. One company turned toward Orpah and the land of Shual. Another company turned toward Beth Haran and another company turned toward the border that looks down on the Valley of Zeboim uh, toward the wilderness. And I think all that the, the author's trying to do here is to show that the Philistines have total power right now. They can go anywhere they want. They're sending out marauding all over this, this valley here. And I, I didn't have a picture for you guys today, but if, if, you, if you look in the back of your Bibles and you look at Michmash and, and, and Geba and, and Gilgal and all those, you, you don't even have to do it right now, but you, you can go back and look. It's all a pretty small little area. And there's lots of these, uh, these wadis that are like these, these kind of caverns of cliffs. We're gonna see that it's actually really important, the geography, when we talk about this next section. Um, but as they are militarily being taken advantage of in all this way, they're actually economically being oppressed as well. And I would say that this is another failure on Saul's point for not having enough foresight to see what's going on in his land. You guys remember the, the verse that talks about uh, watch over your flocks, right? He wasn't doing that. He didn't have foresight in that. And as a spiritual leader, we need to have foresight. We need to be watching what's going on. Uh, so in th- that would be uh, Roman numeral number uh, for there, the controlled commerce. Proverbs twenty seven twelve says, the prudent sees danger and hides himself. Uh, though Saul was really good at hiding himself, uh, the prudent sees danger and hides himself in a good way. Uh, but the simple go on and suffer for it. And I think that's exactly what you see um, in verses 19. It begins, it says, now therefore... Uh, Now there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. And the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make themselves swords and spears. But every one of the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen his plow and his mattock and his axe and his sickle. And the charge was two thirds of a shekel for the plowshares and the mattocks uh, and the third of a shekel for sharpening the axes and for setting the, the goads. So on that day, the battle there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people with Saul and Jonathan, but Saul and Jonathan, his son, had them, and the garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass at Michmash. Complete domination on the Philistines' part, right? They had raised the gas tax so high, okay? Sorry, I don't want to get political here. Um, it, it is a fact of life. Uh, Bill Arnold has said this, the personnel superior, uh, superiority is accompanied by superiority in military equipment. By controlling the monopoly in metallurgically, 
technology and technicians, the Philistines are able to limit Israel's arsenal. While the Philistines' troops have the latest advanced weaponry with finished metal products, Israel is restricted to weapons of wood and stone. It was like that Israel was fighting in the dark ages against what we have now, right? That's, that's the picture of where Saul had, had let the people get to, where only him and his son have a sword. There's no way you're going to beat 30,000 people with 600 and a couple swords, right? Unless, what happens? Unless God intervenes, absolutely, okay? And so there, the author, though it seems like there's this complete control of the Philistines, we're going to see that God actually is going to work through this this very mightily, okay? Um, Oswald, uh, just in the vein of uh, spiritual leadership and foresight and all those kind of things, uh, a leader must be able to see the end results of the policies and methods he or she advocates. Responsible leadership always looks ahead to see how policies will affect future generations. J. Oswald Sanders. And so as we and our families put policies into play, Right, me as a dad, as I as 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 I set up disciplines for my children, and um, and just what we're going to do in life, as we do that as a church, as you do that at your jobs, all of those kind of things. A, a good spiritual leader thinks about the future and thinks about those systems that are put into place. As way of conclusion, in this section of chapter thirteen, and we're gonna we're gonna move through chapter fourteen. What I think is very important. What I think is, is, is really what God's trying to teach us through this is that we need to be men that love him and do his will. Jesus said it best in Matthew 7, 24 through 27. It says, everyone then who hears these words, this is after the Sermon on the Mount, who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and, do, and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and, the, and great was the fall of it. I think that's a very easy way to de, um, describe Saul's kingdom falling because he did not hear the words of God and do them but a very encouraging one for us that if we do hear the words of God and we put into action and do his will, that God will have that foundation, that no matter what happens and circumstances come into this life, that we will be okay because he is our rock. Um, there's a reflection question you guys can have for the end. 15 minutes for the rest of 14. You guys ready? Sermon number two, spiritual fitness for duty exam part two, okay? So we saw the failure of Saul in, in chapter 13. We are now gonna see that that he fails in a completely different way this time too. Now, Jonathan was mentioned in chapter 13 for the very first time. And Jonathan, when contrasted with his father, Saul, is, is night and day. He has faith in the Lord. He loves the Lord. He's an ambitious guy. That's even the first part, the noble ambition of a son, verses one through five. I'll go ahead and read that. It says, one day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah in the pomegranate cave at Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men, including Ahiah, the son of Ahitib, uh, Ichabod's brother, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest, and the Lord in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Within the passes by, by which Jonathan sought to go over the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on the side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of the one was Bozes, and the name of the other was Seneth. Uh, the one crag rose on the north in front of Michmash, and the other in the south front of Geba. Okay, And so what we see is, is that as Saul, I would say, is almost inactive, in leading, Jonathan is ambitious in a noble way. He wants to do the will of the Lord. He wants to try to fight for Israel, okay? We see that in as, as he uh, takes his, his armor bearer and says, come on, let's go to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But Saul is sitting under a pomegranate tree, okay? The other thing that I would say that the author is doing here that is, that is very interesting um, is that those two 
he's, he's, he's setting up what Jonathan is actually doing, okay? This is not an easy thing that Jonathan is doing. There's these two crags, okay? There's these big rocky kind of areas. And the one side is called bozes, which would mean like shining, uh, glittery, height, or slippery, okay? Sounds like a mountain you want to go climbing, right? Um, and the other side is senhe, which is bramble and thorny, okay? And that's exactly where Jonathan wants to go through to get to the, to the Philistines. He is, it, it is nobly ambitious. He thinks that that is what God has called him to do. Um, Warren Wiersbe has said this, um, and I think this is even an encouragement. You know, not everyone in the room had a dad that, uh, that loved them the way they probably should have. Not everybody comes from a family uh, of Christians, all those kind of things. Um, we see that even with a bad dad, you can be a good son. We know sons that are bad sons with good dads. So I think that it's, it's that God is, is gracious and that it's up to the person if they're going to obey the word of God, okay? But Warren, Warren Worsby said this about, about this situation. He said, it's remarkable blessing of the grace of God that a man like Saul should have a son so magnificent as Jonathan. He was a courageous warrior, a born leader, a man of faith who sought to do the will of God. Wouldn't that be nice to have on your F tet, right? Wouldn't that... If there's something after studying this passage that I want more for my life than anything is I want somebody to look at me and be like, that guy loves God's word. That, excuse me. That guy loves God. He loves his word and he's obedient and tries to do his will. That's, that's, that's what we're being called to. So that's the first part. This next part's a little bit longer, but, but we'll get through it. This is really where you start to see that, that Jonathan, as Saul did not trust the Lord, Jonathan trusts and has faith and obeys. Okay. Uh, this is the faith of a son. It says, uh, verse six there, this would be, uh, yeah, verse six. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you heart and soul. Then Jonathan said, behold, we will cross over to the men and we will show ourselves to them. Okay. And I'm going to kind of uh, sum up this, uh, just, just a little bit of this uh, because of time. But, but really what is going to happen is that the, he's basically going to have a test. If, if, if the Philistines say, hey, come up here, we're going to go climb this rocky, slippery mountain bramble, and we're going to go up and, and, and the Lord's going to give us victory. Okay. But a couple things before we do that. Uh, did you notice there when it said, uh, Jonathan's talking to his armor bearer, he says, it may be that the Lord will work for us for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or few that proved that, that, that Jonathan knew God's word. God has done that in the past, right? God, God is faithful, right? Uh, Gideon 300 men, right? And as he's doing this, it shows that, that he has this ambition it shows that he has this faith that, hey, we got to try. This is a hopeless situation, but we got to try because we know who our God is. And sometimes we need to cling to that. Sometimes we're in a hopeless situation, hopeless circumstance, and we just need to cling to, you know what? I've seen God work in the past. Maybe he'll work this time for me. The other thing that I would say, though, is, is Jonathan had earned the respect and friendship of his armor bearer. Okay? And this is this is so important in life. He says, do... Uh, or uh, it says, and then his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart, do as you wish. Behold, I am with you heart and soul. He's basically saying, whatever you want me to do, I'm there. I'll run through a brick wall for you because I know you and I know your character and I know you love God and I know you love his will. Do you guys have friends like that? Are you a friend like that? Right? Uh, John Woodhouse has said this, uh, Jonathan's leadership, by way of contrast, the, uh, highlighted the failure of Saul. But in Jonathan, we are given a glimpse of what kind of leader we need. One who knows God's power, wisdom, goodness, enough to trust him wholly. Um, verse 15, though, I want to tell you the end of this, of what happens here. So they go up to this garrison, and in verse 15, we see that Jonathan's hope in the Lord comes to pass. He says in verse 15, and there was a panic in the camp, in the field, and among all the people, the garrison, and, the, and even the, the raiders trembled, the earth quaked, and it became a very great panic. Now, when there's an earthquake in the Bible, who does that? 
the Lord, right? So the Lord did intervene. They were a small number and they're beating this larger number. Number. He worked with Jonathan's faith. Does that make sense? God is still the one who gets the glory. God is still the one who did this, but he worked with Jonathan's faith. It's, 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 it's a beautiful thing. Um, that next section, we're not even going to read it. It's, it's the Lord's, uh, yeah, the Lord's intervention. Actually, we're going to talk about it real quick. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to hurry up, uh, real quick. We're not going to read the whole thing, but, but what I want you to see here is that Saul continues to make these, these, these bad decisions as a leader. Okay. In, in, in Deuteronomy 20, two through four, it says, and when you draw near to the battle, the priest shall come forward and speak to the people and shall say to them, hear, O Israel, today you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. The Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight against your enemies and give to the territory. Okay, so. Saul then gets involved in the battle. And, and the way that he does that is he brings the Ark of the Covenant. He says, hey, priest, you're here. Like, hurry up and do what you're supposed to do from, from Deuteronomy 20. He brings the Ark of the Covenant, but then he stops him. Notice there, uh, verse 19. Now, now, while Saul was talking to the priest, the tumult in the camp of the Philistines increased more and more. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. So he basically said, hey, hey, stop what you're doing. But listen to uh, what Robert Bergen said about that. He said, sensing that he had a, was about to lose a golden opportunity to rout the enemy, Saul did the unthinkable. He ordered Ahiah to suspend his priestly activities before they were completed. This incredible interruption of the divine pattern in action without precedent, precedent in the Bible was intended to enable Israel to win an even greater victory over the Philistines. So had he waited, had he allowed the priest to do what the priest was commanded to do from the word of God, it would have been a greater victory. And we're going to see that too, as Saul then makes this rash vow. Okay. We're going to go quick too. Uh, number four, the foolishness of a father. You guys are going to have to read this on your own. Um, but basically what happens is I'm going to read a couple verses. It says, and the men of Israel had been hard pressed that day. So Saul laid an oath on the people saying, cursed be the man who eats food until it is evening and I am avenged. Uh, and I am avenged on my enemies. Okay. Real quick. Verse 23, so the Lord saved Israel that day and the battle passed beyond beth -Avon. The Lord's the one that gets the, the credit for this victory. He saved them to this point. Now you think this would be like a point of celebration. You think this would be this amazing, like, man, God worked this victory. But no, what does Saul do? He's being selfish. You can see that from his words. He, he not only made it a rash oath, but he also cursed, okay? And we know this is coming from Saul and not from the Lord. And the way that you see that is, Remember what he said there? Cursed be the man who eats until it is evening, and I am avenged on my enemies. You guys see that? The king is not working with the heavenly king. He's worried about his reputation. He's worried about what's going on in his life. He's not leading the people and worried about God's people and God's reputation, which in the battle of uh, David and Goliath, we're going to see that David was ultimately worried about God's reputation. Okay? Real quick, um, as he does this foolish vow, uh, what, uh, what, what he really does here is he sins in the sense that he's making these man-made commandments that the people are, are going to obey rather than the word of God, okay? This, 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 this was really interesting as I was studying this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 6 says, I have applied all things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written that none of you may be puffed up in favor against another, okay? We are not to go past what this word says. We are bound to this. And like I, like I prayed earlier, Jesus' commands are, uh, he is gentle and lowly. They are not burdensome. But when we start to put man-made commandments and, and, and have people view them as commandments and obey them as commandments, we are in a dangerous place, okay? Okay. Uh, Yes. The way that we see this manifest itself 
Look, look down there at uh, verse 31. So Saul makes this rash. Jonathan is going to eat it, okay? That's going to be something a little bit later on. Um, but what happens is, is 31, it says, they struck down the Philistines that day at Michmash and at Ahalon, and the people were very faint. The people pounced on the spoil and took sheep, oxen, calves, slaughtered them on the ground, and the people ate them with the blood, Okay. Now, if you look at Leviticus 10, uh, 17, 10 through 12, you'll see that it was prohibited that they eat the animals with the blood. And the reason was is that they sacrificed animals, right? Because that, that the uh, verse 11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. Okay? So Saul, by putting a man-made commandment on them, actually caused them to sin against the Lord. Do you see why we have to be so careful in, in going in, uh, in our preferences and what we would tell people that they need to do? We are held to the standard of this book, not any man-made standards. Jesus dealt with this in his day. You guys remember uh, Mark 7, if you go back and read it sometime soon, that Jesus, that the Pharisees were mad at Jesus because his disciples weren't washing their hands before they ate. Okay? That was a man-made, um, that was a man-made uh, command. And this is what Jesus said to them about those things. Mark 7, 9, he says, And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. You do not want to be in that spot. Okay, for sake of time, uh, you guys can go ahead and finish the rest of this. I'm going to sum it up real quick. What happens is, is uh, Saul goes down. Uh, they cast lots for Jonathan. So basically, it's, it's found out that Jonathan had tasted the honey. Okay. So his dad had made the curse. He tastes the honey. Okay, we get to see that. The, the lot is cast. We find out that, that he ate the honey. But we get to see the, the people's response. And we can tell that, that Jonathan is a better spiritual leader than his dad because of the people's response. They actually redeem him in a sense. They purchase him back. It says in 43, or no, let's, let's read this. Uh... 45. It says, Then the people said to Saul, John, uh, Shall Jonathan die who has worked this great salvation in Israel? Far from it. As the Lord lives, there shall not, uh, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people ransomed Jonathan so that he did not die. Then Saul went up uh, from pursuing the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place a day that should have been celebrated and the Lord be glorified turns into a day when Saul is ready to kill his own son because he, he disobeyed a man-made commandment. Do you see how, how, how spiritually unfit for duty Saul is? And let that never be said of any of us. So by way of conclusion, you guys can go ahead. You guys have homework this week, okay? You have to finish reading 14 and everything. I didn't get through all of it. But, but, but what you're gonna see in these last sections is Paul's going to be talked about in actually a pretty good light, okay? And by the standards of the world, he did a lot of things for God in, in fighting the Philistines and, and some other people groups before uh, he started to do these things. So there's this summary of them, and it, and, and it kind of talks about his, um, his, his worldly accomplishments. And so as, as way of concluding in that... Um, there's vanity in worldly accomplishments if our heart's far from God and we fail before him in the spiritual fitness of duty test, okay? Mark 8, 36 through 37 says, for what does it profit a man to gain the world and forfeit his soul? For, for a man can give in return, uh, or excuse me, for what can a man give in return for his soul? Proverbs four twenty three says, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life. You can read John 15 on your own. Um, Michael, I'm going to take one extra minute, okay? Uh, this command, uh, excuse me, this, uh, Jonathan Edwards said it this way. Actually, we have to read Jesus' words first. John 15, 10 says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. Gentlemen, if you want joy in your life, Love the Lord and obey his commands and you will abide in him. You will be a part of that vine, right? He is, he, is, he, is, uh, he is the vine and you will bear much fruit for God if you love him and obey him. 
okay? Jonathan Edwards said it this way. I thought this was really interesting. He says, this commitment to total obedience does not mean a mere negative avoidance of evil practices. It is also means positively obeying God's commands. We cannot say that someone is a true Christian just because he is not a thief, liar, blasphemer, drunkard, sexual, immoral, arrogant, cruel, or fierce. He also has to be positively God-fearing, humble, respectful, gentle, peaceful, forgiving, merciful, and loving. Without these positive qualities, he is not obeying the laws of Christ. Men, we are, we are all spiritual leaders in this room, in different roles in the, in the church, in our families, in the, in the community. What I would tell you is, is that if you love the Lord and you seek to do his will, and you obey his commands, that you will be a blessing to others, unlike Saul was. You will be like Jesus in that sense, okay? That that we are actually put on this earth to be a blessing to others, right? We're supposed to be that salt and light. Um, David, I think, learned this at the end of his life, and this will be the last thing I say today, I promise. Uh, 2 Samuel 23, 1 through 3, if you guys turn there with me real quick. You should highlight this and underline it. Not all of it, but you guys. These are the last words of David, okay? And he speaks to leadership. He says, now these are the last words of David, the oracle of David, the son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. I love, I, I love the way he says that. Verse two, the spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His words are on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me. Okay, catch this part. When one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God, he dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. That is the kind of leader that I want to be. That is the kind of leader I think we're called to. That is what I think God is calling you to. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that all of us in this room would not fail the spiritual duty test in life. Lord, help us to obey your commands. Lord, we know that there will be times that we fail. Lord, but help us to to have those moments where we don't fail, where we do choose your will over others. Lord, I pray if there's any men in this room that are are thinking of, of decisions they have to make, Lord, even flirting with not doing what you're calling them to do, Lord, I pray that they that you would work on their hearts, that you would call them back to yourself, Lord. Guard your church. Guard the men of this church. Guard the purity of this church. Lord, and let us be a blessing to all those that we lead. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.